426 through 620. But basically, once you pick a period, then that's the one you have to run with. So um, for most employers, it's going to be whichever period gives them the most payroll expenses is going to be the most beneficial just based on their payroll cycles. So you said it was 56 days from deposit date or 56 days from the first payroll? payroll first pay date? period, the first pay period following. Thank you. No problem. Um, and this is in the application, it's on page one. It's, uh, it's in the definitions under alternative payroll covered period. Um, and again, in Excel, I'll probably try to create just an example or a template to fill out, but um, I don't see how we're going to get a, around calculating it both ways. What we might want to do is just add a week based on their pay periods and then try to figure out the timing because, you know, this is like a pretend company, but depending on when their payroll cycles are and when their rent payments are, it might affect which week you pick. So all of our clients, we're gonna to have to know what their pay periods are and like the start of the actual pay period and the ending, and then figure out what those two options are and then see which one has a greater amount of expenses. And that also, if they're hiring people back, for example, it might be better for them to have it be the later of the two, so it gives them time to ramp up expenses or rehire. So it's gonna be a little bit more complicated than we initially thought here. Um, I'm going to read the definition of compensation um, or eligible payroll costs. Uh, it's payroll costs paid and payroll costs incurred during the eight-week covered period or alternative covered period. Payroll costs are considered paid on the day that paychecks are distributed or the borrower originates an ACH credit transaction. Payroll costs are considered incurred on the day that the employee pay is earned. Payroll costs incurred but not paid during the borrower's last pay period of the covered period or alternative covered period are eligible for forgiveness if paid on or before the next regular payroll date. Otherwise, payroll costs must be paid during the covered period or the alternative period. Um, so how I'm interpreting that is basically, if it's incurred but not paid by the end of the covered period, then it's still eligible for forgiveness if it's incurred, as long as it's paid on or before the next regular payroll date. So you can't pay people early, but like if um, your covered period ended on a Friday, let's say, you could still take all the earned compensation through that Friday, even if your payroll cycle, if it wasn't going to pay until the following Friday. Does that make sense? So it's, it's payroll costs paid and payroll costs incurred. Um, and then the other uh, piece of that is that cash compensation eligible for forgiveness cannot exceed an annual pay of 100,000 um, and it's prorated for the covered period. And that number is $15,385. In an eight-week period. Um, so basically, for each individual, you're going to be capped at fifteen thousand three hundred and eighty-five for that eight-week period. That's only wages. So benefits um, would be on top of that, is my understanding. I haven't seen any reason to think that benefits aren't in addition to. I'm trying to see if there's any other um, definitions worth talking about. Um, I'm going to run through this just because it's a high level calculation. I don't know if you all had a chance to watch the video, but um, like I said, this 75% rule still applies. That has not changed. Um, so 75% of your expenses need to be payroll related. Um, and then this headcount calculation, you don't have to do it by week. You can do like a monthly average or by pay period. I think it's easier just to pull all the payrolls in that time frame and then pull, you know, calculate the FTE. Um, 
this hourly amount would be divided by 40 now, not divided by um, 30. So that's a, a change. So you're still gonna take your two FTE counts for your two covered period. One is uh, February 15th of 19 through the end of June of 19. The other comparison period is January 1st of 20 through the end of February of 20. So you're still gonna take the lower of those of the two and then you're gonna compare that for your FTE for your covered period. Um, it does look like though, if you have the same amount of FTE by June 15th, they're calling that like a FTE safe harbor. And so if your FTE is the same, you get like a one multiple, meaning it's not gonna reduce uh, for the FTE part. But we'll walk through like the actual application here in a minute. Um, this uh, salary wage reduction is still in effect. So same gist, if they haven't, if they're not making 75% what they were making in Q1, there's gonna be a reduction there. And it's on an employee by employee basis. So you have to pull all employees that are not paid six figures. And you have to compare what they were paid in Q1 on an annualized basis to what they're being paid during that cover period. So it's really only gonna be people that were moved to part-time or they did a pay cut. Um, so pay cut more than 25% or, you know, moving someone from full-time to part-time. Does anyone have questions just on this page? I'm not, I don't know how much people have had a chance to digest it in advance. So it might just be <laughs> totally over everyone's head or maybe people are understanding it enough to be dangerous. Um. One thing I wanted to point out, Shannon, was you had told me that since, like for Badger, our pay period is every two weeks, and so it's okay to just list out every two week salary amounts. Yeah. Yeah. So, like, um, we're not calculating weekly salaries. So, like, in this example, we're just putting it in the times where it was actually paid. Um, and then same for FTE count. It doesn't have to be weekly. You can you can use it by pay period. Um, that's fine. And then this uh, qualified expenses. One thing that um, is in here, like if you look at the covered expenses, it's very specific that it's payroll costs, business mortgage interest payments, business rent or lease payments, and then business utility payments. So I am not seeing where it says that you can take other interests for business debt other than mortgage interest payments. Um, so, mortgage have, interest do they, has to be secured by like a real property, like on a building or land, like a mortgage debt, or would it be any secure debt? Like, if it's secured by anything, would that count as mortgage? Um, great question. This is the the wording. It says uh, non payroll cost eligible. It's covered mortgage obligations, payments of interest, not including prepayment. So they can't just make a payment early. So it's important for them to know that. Um, on any business mortgage obligation on real or personal property incurred before February 15th. So it has to be a business mortgage interest. Like I know for Vapor Point, for example, we had interest on just like their revolver or their debt. Um, it does not look to me like that's eligible anymore. So I think all, a lot of people were hoping it was just business interest because Prior, they had some things that said like big business mortgage interest, but then when you looked at the guidance, it just said kind of business interest. So I think people were hoping that it would be wider, but um, this very specifically says it's a mortgage obligation um, on real or personal property. So it would and be on vehicles or equipment. Does that consider, I always think of mortgage as being on real property, but then it says personal property. So um Am, am I like? It's a great question because it's calling it a mortgage obligation. So I struggle if you can. It, it says it has to be a business mortgage obligation. So. But then it's saying personal property. Yeah, it says on real or personal property. And then it says business mortgage payment. So maybe there'll be some more um, questions or guidance on that specifically. Let me look up something real quick. I 
trying to think if he could justify that, but it's pretty. It seems like it would have to be a mortgage. I'm sure there's going to be some chatter about that one specifically. Um, yeah, I thought earlier when they were talking about it, it almost sounded like all business interests. It's like I kept seeing different things that looked like all business interests. So, um, I don't know. It seems like it's gonna have to be a mortgage loan. I, I don't. It, to me, it seems like the intent is for it to be a mortgage loan only, not leasing on vehicles. Um, well, I, I can't think the leasing has to be like a secured, like if they have equipment, if they have equipment or vehicles or things, and yeah. then, you know, and they were secured by a title, but it was a loan. Yeah. Well, and I think if it said just any debt obligations that were backed up by real or personal property, I would say probably, but I think since it specifically says mortgage, that's kind of what gives me pause. So let's just put that as an action item, maybe to research further, because obviously it's going to be good for our clients if we can make the argument for other types of debt. But based on the definition here, it kind of looks like it has to be a mortgage. Um, so let's add that as like a research point. Um, and then... It says covered rent obligations. It's business rent or lease payments for lease agreements for real or personal property enforced before February 15th. So this says business rent or lease payments. So for this piece specifically, I think that like lease payments on a printer or if they lease vehicles or lease equipment, to me, it looks like it would qualify right now based on the definition. Because it's a rent obligation, it says business rent or lease payments for real or personal property. So it seems like leases are fair game to include. So we want to make sure we have a good handle on like what vehicles, if any, are leased versus purchased. But it does seem strange to me that they would include like lease payments on vehicles, for example, but not interest on debt for vehicles. So it seems kind of inconsistent for specifically like vehicles and equipment. And then um, the other one is covered utility payments, business payments for a service uh, for electricity, gas, water, transportation, telephone, or internet for which the service began before February 15th. I don't see trash, which has come up a couple times. Um, it's probably so immaterial. I don't know that we need to take a stand on it right now. If a client can qualify without trash, I would just exclude it because it's not specified. And then it says um, an eligible non-payroll cost must be paid during the cover period or incurred during the cover period and paid on or before the next regular billing date. So again, if it's incurred during that cover period, so like let's say your utility bill was incurred for that period, but it wasn't paid till the following cycle. Um, most of those things you have to prepay them, I think anyways. So, um, but some utilities, they kind of bill you after the fact. For example, if it's incurred during that cover period, you could take it as long as you're paying it that next cycle. Um, Eligible non-payroll costs cannot exceed 25% of the forgiveness amount. Count non-payroll costs that were both paid and incurred. Shannon? Mm-hmm. So I have um, this might be, might be a stupid question, but so basically we're calculating all this. If they don't spend all the money, basically, if they get to the you know 56 days and they have not spent all the money. And you're really calculating the forgiveness only on the portion I assume that they have spent, and then anything they have not spent is would not be eligible for forgiveness. But they could, in theory, keep it as an outstanding loan for cheap debt. Right? Yeah, I would convert so to a loan. It would just convert to a loan. They don't have to return it. No, my understanding, to your point, so my understanding is if you don't spend it, it converts to a loan at 1% versus 
everything you don't spend, you have to give it back. And then the unforgivable portion converts to a loan at 1%. So my understanding is whatever you qualified for at the beginning, you can keep, but whatever's not forgiven will convert to a loan. So I don't think, and, and from this application, I'm not seeing like, oh, well, you didn't spend 15,000, so now you have to pay back. And then, oh, and then 20,000 of that wasn't forgivable, so now that's a loan, if that makes sense. So I think it's just like, whatever's not forgiven converts to a loan. You just do this calculation, 75% of what they spent needs to be payroll, 25% of what they spent can be non-payroll, and then, and potentially though that 25%, if they need all the, all those other rules, then that 25% is also part of the forgivable amount, correct? Like it's not, like, they think that part can be forgiven. It's not just the payroll part that can be forgiven. Correct. Um, so... Let's say if their loan uh, is a million dollars, um, in theory, they need to spend 750,000 of it on payroll, but let's say only 700,000 was spent on payroll, it would automatically disqualify that $50,000 difference because they didn't meet that 75% threshold. But it doesn't mean then that if they had 100,000 of other expenses that were non-payroll costs, that it would necessarily negate those. Um, at least that's my understanding. So. It's not like if you don't hit the 75% threshold that like none of your non-payroll expenses will be forgiven. It, my understanding is it's like a like proportional, like they, they're gonna take that off the top. Um, at least that's how I understand it as of now. Um, this is the actual application, the actual form. So um, here's the instructions and it kind of gives some High level, like you're going to need the SBA, the actual loan number, which all the banks have. That's that, like, you know, that ETRAN number a lot of them are giving. We're going to need that. And then the lender is going to have a number assigned internally. And so they're going to have to provide us with that. Um, the rest of it's kind of self explanatory, like loan amount. Um, employees at the time of the loan application, um, I'm taking this as the date, whatever date that application was submitted. Um, and I think that the employee number was on the application, if I remember correctly. Um, so you'd want it to like agree to whatever was submitted that day. Um, and then they ask you for your employees at the time of forgiveness. And then they want your loan disbursement date. This EIDL advance amount, um, there were these EIDL kind of grants that most of them were for $10,000, but I believe it was like $1,000 per employee up to 10. Um, so you're going to want to confirm if your client received the EIDL. Um, and so that was called the EIDL advance payment. Um, and you're going to want to go ahead and get their EIDL application number if they applied for that EIDL, which I think a lot of our clients kind of were running both parallel. So we're going to have to get a copy of that application number. Like I know for me, like I don't necessarily have that information. So I'm going to have to ask for it. So we might want to go ahead and start requesting some of this basic information for our records for clients, just so that we're not scrambling later trying to chase it. Um, so here's where they make you elect like which schedule you're going to pick, whether you're going to do the 56 days from that um, funding date or see it's like the loan disbursement date, or if you're going to do um, 56 days that starts the first day of the next pay period. Um, so you'll basically like check one. Um, there's a bigger requirement for people that had a loan over 2 million, but I don't think that any of our clients were over 2 million. Um, none that I know of. Margaret, you didn't have any that were over 2 million, did you? I don't think so. If any, it would have been streamlined, but I don't think theirs was that much. Yeah, I was going to say Vapor Point was 1.3. And they're the biggest one that I know of and that and they're 1.3. So I think we're going to fall under, um, they came out with a safe Harbor last Thursday, which was kind of exciting because it's basically saying that like, you don't have to prove that your business was going to go under or something crazy was going to happen if you didn't have the money. Cause I know a lot of people were kind of concerned about taking the loan because they're like, well, I might need it, but I don't know if I need it. And so what happens if I take it and then my business is really fine? Like, is the government going to come after me <laughs> and charge me with a felony? Because there was a lot of really strong wording like flying around. And so um, 
they did come out with a $2 million safe harbor, basically saying, if you're a small business and your loan was less than 2 million, they're basically going to give you the benefit of the doubt that you probably needed it because you don't probably have access to like a ton of capital. If your business is that small, that there's just a high likelihood that you needed it. So um, the assumption of just need is almost automatic if your loan was less than 2 million. So if you get questions from clients that are like, how do I need to prove that I needed it and all that kind of thing, just let them know that there is a safe harbor now. And that just came out last Thursday. Um, so we talked about eligible payroll costs, mortgage interest payments. Um, so this was kind of the definitions that we went over, the eligible payroll costs, non-payroll costs. So this is where the definitions are just for reference. Um, but you get into this actual form. So this is the form that we'll actually fill out. So here's all the basic information. So that's kind of a given payroll schedule, covered period or alternative, depending on what you're picking. And then making sure that if you were in excess of 2 million, which I don't think any of us, any of ours will be. Um, so payroll and non-payroll costs. So payroll costs, let's say 500,000 mortgage interest, business rent lease, business utility. Then you have this FTE adjustment. And so it's your total salary hourly wage reduction, which is, it's a whole different schedule. So we'll get to that in a minute. And then basically they're having you add up all these expenses together and then subtract line five. So um, let's say all of your expenses were a million dollars but you reduce your 100,000 people more than 25%, and that was about $50,000 that you were short. You're gonna subtract it here. So they're gonna have you add all of these amounts and then subtract your wage reduction. And so then you're gonna have an FTE reduction quotient. So this is almost like a multiple that's gonna be calculated based on your FTE change. And that's on a, we'll get to schedule A in a minute because it kind of walks through more like the how to actually calculate each one. Um, so potential forgiveness amounts, it's gonna take what's left after your reduction. So let's say we reduce people's pay past the 25%, so we had to knock off 50 grand. Then we have this FTE reduction. We reduced our FTE by 10%, so now you're only gonna get a 0.9 multiple. So it's gonna take your net amount, it's gonna multiply that net times this multiple number. And then that's just going to be your total potential forgiveness. And then it's going to take your loan amount. And then it's going to make sure that you at least did 75% of payroll costs. So it kind of goes through this like waterfall here. Um, so potential amount, loan amount, the payroll costs, and then the forgiveness amount. Um, enter the smallest of eight nine and 10. So it's either your full loan amount, smallest of nine or 10, sorry, payroll costs. I'm trying to follow the line one, divide one by 0.75. I'm trying to think how this would actually work. So if you had line one, which is all your payroll costs, and that was 75%. I don't understand why the forgiveness amount would only be payroll. That's kind of how that reads, isn't it? Am I crazy? Yeah, sorry, I'm kind of talking about this. So add this, this, this. No, because this would be the total of all of it. I'm not really following line 10, to be totally honest. I'm thinking that line eight would might include all your other stuff up there. Because it does. Line 8 does. And so it's just... Um, but then it's so taking it's the, the smaller of the three. So that almost makes it seem like your max forgiveness amount. Well, and these reflect that you had a reduction for other things. Like, yeah. So as long as you didn't have any reductions based on those things, then it would be Although it does make it sound at, at 10, 75% requirement. Divide line one. 
Hold on a second. Well, if you're dividing it by 0.75, though, it's actually making it bigger. So I guess it's saying, like, if your payroll cost, for example, was half a million dollars, you would divide it by 0.75. So that means your max forgiveness amount would be, like, 666. So it's basically backing into what yeah, your max okay. because of what 75% of your payroll cost was. So, um, so basically, if you only spent 70% on payroll, it's going to reduce your full amount that can be forgiven. So that, that makes sense to me. So basically they're backing into that based on what percentage was your payroll cost. So if you only spent 60% of your loan on payroll costs, it's going to basically back into a number. So let's say you had a million dollar loan and you only spent 60% on payroll, which was 600,000. It would automatically cap your forgiveness amount at 800,000 meaning you automatically can't take those couple hundred that you were short of that payroll. Yeah. So they're kind of doing, they're backing into what your cap is basically. Yeah. So it's the cap based on what percent was based on payroll, either the full loan amount or this amount that has all the qualified expenses, this calculation. So it's like one, two, three, and then they're taking the lesser of the three. Um, that makes sense. So. Yeah. Then there's this kind of certification section, which we can skip over for now. This is instructions for Schedule A, but I'm just gonna skip to it so we can spend some time looking at it. Um, so here's the Schedule A where they actually walk through like cash compensation, FTE, and it's coming from these tables. So I'm gonna go ahead and skip to the tables and then we can come back. Um, so here's this Schedule A worksheet. So um, you list all employees uh, that were employed during the cover period. Um, and then this is all, this is like the less than 100,000 calculation. So you're literally going to list out every single employee and how much they were paid in that covered period and then how much their wages were reduced. And then here you have people that received comp more than 100,000 and they're going to have you basically like cap it off. So down here is where they're coming up with an FTE safe harbor. So when we talk about like those comparison periods, um, it's enter the borrower's average FTE between February and April. So that's that one base period. And then enter the FTE during inclusive of February 15, 2020. Um, and if one's greater than the other, and then here they're having you enter in their FTE as of June 30th of 2020. But it says if the entry for four is greater than or equal to two, then enter number one on line 13. So basically they're gonna give you a one multiple for that FTE, as long as your FTE by June 30th is back up where it was before. Does that make sense? So if you're back up to your February 15th, so, as of June 30th, if your FTE is back up greater than or equal to your FTE in this February 15th period, then you're going to get a one multiple on line 13 of your schedule, which is um, here. So it's only going to help you on this part. It's not going to help you on the, you know, reduction of 25, but it's going to basically not ding you for your FTE count. And then this is the documentation requirements. Everybody should just skim through it, but it's basically um, the bank statements or the payroll. I think the payroll reports is sufficient. I don't think you should have to pull it all the way back to the bank statements. I think if you just have the payroll reports for each pay period, and then I would go ahead and include the tax forms. Um, and I would just create a folder that kind of has all that data for that covered period. Um, they want you to give the FTE data and everything to the borrower, but um, the requirements of the borrower is basically that they just need to spend a reasonable amount of time reviewing it at a high level. Um, it looks like the borrowers, the, excuse me, the lender is not going to be required to like attest that they've like done like a formal audit of those numbers. The burden of proof is really on the borrower to be disclosing accurate numbers. 
Um, so from that perspective, I think a lot of our clients are going to need us to help build this because the lender is not going to help them do it. Um, so we're going to have to document FTE February 15th to June of 19, FTE January 1st to February 29th, or there's some seasonal rules. I don't really think we have any clients that are super seasonal that I can think of um, or that would be following this methodology. If we do, we can maybe have a discussion offline about that, but I don't think anybody falls into that bucket. Um, and then we need to support like all the lists for all the people, the wage reduction, um, backup for the expenses, things like that. Um, I don't think there's anything major on here. This FTE calc, I think that our, um, our kind of FTE summary is easier to follow. It's just that we might almost want to put it at like an employee level. So we could, um, trying to think of the best way to structure it. It would almost be easier just to like break this out by employee or something. I'm trying to think of what format would be easiest. It's the same calculation that we've already gone over though in that Excel sheet. Nothing really major has changed. It's just now that we have this template we have to fill in. Um, I'm going to pause for a minute. Does anybody have questions? I know this is clear as mud. Has, does everyone have a copy of this application or has everyone seen it? I'll post a copy to teams right now. Do we need to have time to digest it and then just kind of answer questions as they come? Or should I try to, I was gonna try to create a template in Excel cause I just think like this template down here is kind of confusing. So I was thinking it might just be easier for us to have a different format, but maybe that wouldn't be beneficial. I don't know. And then do you think the application is gonna be the same for all banks or do you think that different banks are gonna require different applications? Um, that's a great question. Um, my understanding is this is sort of a default application that the SBA has provided. Um, so it's actually like an SBA form released on the 20th. It says, oh, sorry, May of 20. Um, so I think it's going to be pretty much uniform across everybody. Now, what I think will be a little bit different will be what documentation the bank will want from us, um, to support the data. Um, I do think having a lead sheet, like a having a lead sheet like this is helpful to walk them through all the numbers and then having, you know, a folder that has all the support for each number in a way that's easy to follow um, will be helpful for them. So if we have like the application and then somehow we kind of easily have each payroll run um, and then all the non non payroll qualified expenses, just we're going to have to have it organized in a really easy to follow way because the lender is going to have to take a pass at it. Yeah. Um, it's funny because they talk about payroll forms like 941s and I'm like, that's not super helpful. Depending on when your eight week period is, it's not going to tie to anything. So yeah. it's like you would almost just need to have the actual payroll run from like ADP or QuickBooks or whoever. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I don't know, maybe that's a, maybe it's a waste of time. I don't know if it's helpful for me to put something in Excel like this where we want to populate things maybe in Excel and then put it into the form or are we kind of like, well, we'll just fill out the form. I don't know. Is this helpful or well, not? I, I think that it goes back to like the survey, like the clients that we are providing the service for, we're going to do like a weekly kind of status update with them. I do think having something in Excel that we can review with them. Can you guys hear me? Okay. I don't have my mic on, on here. No, I think yeah. like having like a, a weekly tracker in Excel, I think that that would be useful, then you can use that data to populate the, the form. 
What we did with um, Vapor Point, for example, was we have this payroll and qualified expenses, and then we just created a summary that had the total, and then um, we had the percent, like what percent was payroll um, and non-payroll, and then how much wasn't spent. This isn't Vapor Point, but this is an example. Um, is Megan on the line by chance? She might not be here. I'm here. Sorry, I was on mute. No, you're fine. Um, do you happen to have the payroll, uh, the one for Vapor Point, easily accessible? Um, yes. If I stop sharing, could you uh, pull it up real quick? Um, and I thought it was helpful. We had their first like kind of a weekly review last Friday, and we were at least able to see kind of where we stand currently, so we could start making some decisions. Um, so hopefully, Megan, it'll let you. There we go. Thank you. So um, it's the same uh, worksheet. And what we did was we populated um, like an estimate of where the expenses would be. So if you go to the payroll tab first, Megan, mm -hmm. we kind of populated like what we knew was coming. Now, this was when we thought it was going to be based on paid, not you know, accrued or incurred. So we're going to have to spend some time looking at that piece just to make sure we're not missing payroll expenses. Um, but basically out of this, we could see that we were going to be about 155,000 short of the 75%. And then we could see for our FTEs that we were going to be fine because we actually, we were fine um, on our FTE numbers for the comparison periods. Um, and then go to the qualified expense real quick. So then we have all the qualified expenses here, which we had um, interest on debt. We were including some non-mortgage debt in there. So those numbers are gonna change. Um, but equipment lease payments, I think we can add. So we're gonna make some edits um, to add equipment lease payments. And so we have some tweaks here. But then we could basically see like where we were at for payroll in total. And then out of that meeting, we're like, we're going to be about 366,000 short of like the total um, amount. So we know based on kind of just what we see now that we're pretty far behind. Um, one thing that's going to be challenging is um, having the exact numbers for payroll we're going to have to have their pay cycles and have to know basically what their average payroll cost is almost like per day so that we can forecast what that accrued payroll is going to be. So for vapor point in this instance, um, they, their payroll period like ends around this, uh, 616. So their next payroll is like that following week. So for them, the period would end on 616, but their payroll is on 619. So I would think that you could include that payroll because it's been incurred because the pay date cut off on the 14th, like before the lending, before the period was up. Um, but what I'm unclear on is their funds deposited on 421 and their first payroll was on 424. So then do you have to back off the other pay period, the payroll for like the previous incurred? Because it looks to me like it says paid or incurred. So I would think you could take payroll. Incurred. I think you can include both because it says paid or incurred. So I think this one at 428 is what was paid after they got the loans and then they continued to accrue any cost up to the date, ending date incurred. So we might almost be able to get in like a whole extra pay cycle, like in that week eight, because we know that they've incurred a whole additional pay period at that point that's going to be paid like three days later. So I think that we'll be able to add like a whole payroll cycle. At least that's how I'm reading it. But um, that's something that I'm kind of hoping as more guidance comes out with this new application that we'll get some clarity around. But, but as it stands now, it looks like it'd be paid or incurred, so you could probably take it. Um, so that would be good for Vapor Point, obviously. It would put them over that 75% threshold.
I think like the, the short of it is it's like, I think we know enough to be dangerous at this point, but I don't think it's like a hundred percent clear yet. Um, but like using kind of this Excel format by week is sort of what makes sense to me as far as just trying to track it. And then I think more information comes out kind of every week. Um, but based on the new, uh, based on the application, I don't think we're doing anything incorrectly really. It was just the 40 hours. That was the only big change. The rest of our methodology and what we're doing here, I think is accurate. So there was, except um, interest only being mortgage and then adding lease payments, some clarity around that. Shannon, I have a question. So if, if we find that our clients are gonna be short, what is our recommendation to them? Like how, um, like you were saying with VaporPoint, maybe they can squeeze in that last payroll, but what are some other recommendations? Um, that's a great question. I, uh, so this, this is my personal opinion. I don't know if this should be like our firm stance, but um, if someone's close, there's like a few strategic things that they can do. So for example, um, you might want to, you know, pay out a bonus um, to your employees that have been, you know, working really hard during the period. Like, let's say you're just a little bit short of that 75% threshold or something, or you don't want to have a non-forgivable piece. And let's say you're, you know, ten, fifteen thousand dollars short. Like if they're going to be close, um, you could pay out a bonus. I think there's clients that do um, profit sharing at the end of the year, and depending on what kind of plan they have, if their 401k allows it, they could um, distribute some of their profit sharing bonuses sooner in the year. Um, what? my position is it, it really needs to be something that is truly earned and is in a normal course of business. So I would not recommend an owner, um, you know, creating, let's say they're going to bonus themselves or something if they're making less than a hundred and they're just going to kind of randomly pay themselves a bunch of money. You would want to make sure that it's documented um, kind of the reason for the bonus and that it's actually justified. Or if somebody's going to do pay increases, like, I think it, it gets in kind of dangerous territory if we're gonna, um, well, we're gonna increase people's pay for eight weeks and then we're gonna bring it back down. Things like that, I just would, I wouldn't advise clients to do it. Um, but I do think if you wanna do spot bonuses and things, or if you wanna pay out profit sharing early, I think those are some good strategies. Um, basically, if an employer, if their business is ramping up, the, the gist is that they wanna be getting up to full capacity and full compensation and full, staffing as quickly as they can. Um, the other piece of that, my personal opinion is that they need to run their business profitably, how they need to run their business. And so I have heard some owners that are like, well, we're gonna go, should we just go hire a bunch of people? And I'm like, no, you shouldn't do that because like getting you know, two months of payroll for free from the government's cool, I guess, but like, that's not going to solve the issue if you're overstaffed after this and you, you know, are running an unprofitable company. So I, I tend to be more conservative and like, we'll run your business smartly and profitably. And then if the rest of it converts to a 1% loan, then so be it, you know? Um, so that's kind of a long answer, but I think that there's a few strategic things they can do, but I think if they're far off, like I would not advise them to overhire or make, just unwise business decisions just for the sake of the loan, if that makes sense. Question, Shannon. Um, did I read something about owners of the company not being able to give themselves raises? Can they give themselves a raise right now to get there and, um, if it's within reason? I would so, say yes, but it's only so, gonna have an impact if they're already less than 100,000. So let's say they're already paying okay. themselves 120, well, if they bump themselves to 130, 140, yeah. that's not going to, but yeah, well, you have is, some owners that are paying themselves like 40 and they really should be paying themselves 80 or 90, then right. I, I would, I would go ahead and make that change. Yes. And that's good. Okay. So, I mean, I have one specifically like that, that yes. I, and I said within reason, I wouldn't go super crazy, but you it needs to be a market to make that. Okay. Uh, but it's not going to be suspicious if they give themselves a raise at this time. Or not I if it's a market rate. And I, I just didn't know if I'd seen something recently that said that there was a penalty for doing that. Um, I don't know. If, if you see that, please let me know. Cause I haven't seen it. And what I've communicated is 
if it's a market rate for the position and it's in a normal course of business and it's a reasonable operating expense based on the market rate for what you're doing, I think it's okay. But I, what I don't think people should do is be egregious with it. Um, I don't know, I think it was Kim Ford, she said, what did she say? Um, pigs get fat and hogs get slaughtered or something. <laughs> it's, like what, it's like, if there's some things that you can do and you're not paying yourself market rate, I think that there's, it makes sense to do it. But I think if anybody is being egregious or really trying to take advantage, like escalate that to me if needed so I can help deal with it because we just don't want to be in that gray space. You know what I mean? But yeah, I think, I think if it's a market rate and they've been underpaying themselves, maybe in the past, I think it's okay to increase it. Yeah. Uh, Shannon, do you think that um, deferring payments on non-payroll items would be egregious or gray area? Um, can you give me an example? Well, if you wanted to defer rent, maybe pay it outside of the eight week period or utilities. Um, close, you know, if you're right around that, you know, the uh, 75%. Oh, because if paying that would put you under 75%. Um, I don't think, I don't think deferring is as much of a concern as prepaying. Um, Cause I think not that many people are going to hit the 75%, but then have 25% of non-qualified payroll expenses. I think most people payroll is their biggest expense. Um, but if they, if they choose to claim less funds, for qualified expenses, I don't think that that matters. And even in the, the application, it says to like the, the qualified expenses that you're claiming basically for the purpose of the loan. So I think that you could elect like not to claim July rent if you don't want to claim July rent. Um, but the piece that I do see them specifically saying is that you can't take prepayments. So if they're trying to accelerate a rent payment, for example, to get it in, early they wouldn't be able to take that so if their covered period ends like let's say at the end of june they can't like prepay july rent so um so i would say deferrals are probably fine because it doesn't say you have to claim everything but you can't claim prepayments um sure. i don't know if that is your question And, and I would say to you guys, like, if you all read guidance out there, or you see things about specific issues, like, please talk to me about it. I'm not like a, a PPP expert. Like, I've tried to get my arms around it, but there's obviously a lot of pieces. So as you all run into things or run into issues with your clients, like, please share them so we can all kind of collaborate together. So, so Shannon, I was, this is what I read about the owner's salaries. And it came off uh, the BFG document you sent us. And it said, forgiveness includes any amounts paid to owners, owner employees, a self-employed individual or general partners capped at the 15,385 for the 100,000 for each individual or the eight week equivalent of the applicable compensation in 2019, whichever is lower. And it says, this means that owners cannot increase their compensation during the CP, ACP, to be higher than their average was in 2019. Huh. Is that because it wasn't in effect by February 15th? Is that what they're saying? I don't get it. I don't know. That's, uh, yeah, I didn't totally understand that either. Okay. Um, would you mind just sending me that little blurb in an email and I'll, I'll ask yeah. them a clarification on that because I don't, I don't necessarily agree with that because if an owner wants to increase an employee's comp within reason right now, like I don't see any reason why they can't. And if they're an S corp specifically, I mean, they're an employee. So as long as it's not egregious, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I haven't seen that, but okay. uh, send that to me and let's follow up on that question. Okay. But um, I want to be sensitive to everyone's time. I don't know that we've answered all the questions except just to establish maybe some more ideas and the fact that it's not totally uh, nailed down yet. Um, I would use that Excel tracker as a starting point and start tracking like the weekly stuff. Um, and then it might make sense, Crystal, for me with the clients that want us to track for maybe me to meet separately with you to, we can run through maybe those clients specifically. Um, cause I think every situation is going to be a little unique. So, um, maybe I could schedule some meetings with people to go over individual clients and then we can kind of come up with a game plan for each client. Um, if that would be beneficial, um, we can do that.
still trying to get kind of our arms around who we're doing it for and who. Um, so we have some that have confirmed, but then some we're kind of waiting on. So um, yeah, and we need to push that quick. If you think about, most of them got funded kind of mid end April, so we're probably already yep. four weeks in. So um, what I would encourage everyone to do is like start with the Excel sheet that's in Teams come up with just kind of a, a starting point for structure to get in your payroll and your qualified expenses as a starting point. And then that way, when you meet with, um, you know, your manager or we cl start collaborating with Crystal or myself, we at least have a baseline of some kind of information that we can start working with, you know, and start asking questions and sort of solidify it. Um, and then also we need access. We need to know what their payroll cycles are. So make sure you have that too. So when we meet to go over that client, we can, Kind of walk through which cover or which period we should use um so maybe what we should do uh is maybe by this week everyone can start kind of trying to take a pass for the ones we know that we're doing and then next week since it's not a close week next week and the beginning of the following week before close would be a good time for us to have those kind of initial meetings just to start reviewing the clients that we are doing it for so maybe maybe that's just the plan for the next week and then we can kind of reassess well, cool. sounds good. Um, so I don't know if it's super helpful, but um, I will, I, I posted the application out there and encourage everyone to read it. Um, if you have specific questions, like let's start IMing in that Teams channel, like, you know, hey, this is what we read here. And then we can look and say, okay, as a firm, like let's take kind of this stance on that or um, just so that we all kind of have a, a place to ask questions and communicate because I know it's difficult to have all of, all of us on the same page with gu guidance that's not even complete. So it's kind of challenging. Um, but I appreciate everyone's effort and, um, thank you. So, uh, post on teams. If you have a question, if you run into something, please put it on that team's channel. Cause I'll be reviewing that. And that way everyone can see it. Cause if you have a question, I guarantee you somebody else has the same question. <laughs> I probably have the same question. So <laughs> we'll, we'll work through it. Um, anything else? I want to be sensitive to everyone's time. I know we're running a little over. As of right now, we should keep using the tracker that's in that channel. Yeah, okay. just change the hour, change the hours to 40, basically, uh, for the requirement, and then um, use 0.5 FTE for uh, people that aren't full time, um, and then let's go from there. So, um, thank you, everyone. I appreciate your time. Thanks, Shannon. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. And Bye -bye. I, rec thank I you. recorded this, so I'll post the link in the channel. Awesome. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yep.